Hello, and welcome to episode 15 of Charlotte Mecklenburg History with Dan Morrill. Today is June 21st, 2020, and I am Dan's daughter, Mary Dana, and I'm here today with Dan through Zoom. It is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Dad, to you. Mary Dana, that is a wonderful day, and one of the great events of my life was becoming your father. Oh, well, that's kind of you to say. You're, you've Indeed. certainly and, been and, an, and happy an inspiration. Father's Day to all the fathers who watch this podcast. Absolutely. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Yep. And so last week we uh, ran out of time to talk about everything that we wanted to, and we really wanted to spend time discussing the slave cemeteries in Mecklenburg County, because my dad has done a lot of research with that, and he knows um, a lot about them. And they can be difficult to find and know where they are because they're unmarked for the most part. Um, Dad, isn't that right? That's right. That's right. So, that's okay. Right. So um, I'm going to let you take over. You know, just a personal story. One of my friends is a man named Steve Crump. Steve is a wonderful African-American gentleman that I've known for literally years. And you might know, Mary Dana, that uh, they celebrated the end of slavery on Friday. Yes. It was the, you know, the, the, the time to celebrate that. And what he did for that Juneteenth birthday. Or holiday. Anniversary. Hol holiday. Holiday. Was to go and take flowers to slave cemeteries. Oh. Here in, 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 in Mecklenburg County. And one of them that he spent a good bit of time at was the one at Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church. And that's a very, very interesting story. So let me start out talking about the slave cemetery at Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church and how I particularly became involved with it. <clears throat> okay. Now Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church, you remember we talked last time about the fact that so many of the early settlers who came into the back country of the Carolinas were Scots-Irish Presbyterians. And so a lot of the oldest churches that we have in Mecklenburg County, which was really a center of Scots-Irish migration in the 1700s, are Presbyterian churches. Now, obviously this is not an original sanctuary building. It's a more modern building, but it's a very vibrant church. And many, it's out near UNCC. And many people know Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church because annually they hold a big barbecue, the Mallard Creek barbecue. And politicians, of every type go to that barbecue. So it's a, it's a well-known Presbyterian church. Well, several years ago, and I, I was actually employed as a consultant to be involved with this, the word came that an outfit called Top Golf was going to locate essentially very close to this church. And I'm not speaking against Top Golf. I'm not criticizing anybody. But Top Golf is a very dramatic incident in the built environment. You know, big parking lot, a lot of people, long hours. You see those big poles all around the uh, holes. They light those up at night, and goodness gracious, it's, it's, it's really something. Well, not surprisingly, neither Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church and more especially the immediate neighbors did not want a top golf to locate right there in the neighborhood. And so some of them had heard, some of the people in the neighborhood had heard that there was a slave cemetery on the land where they wanted to put the top golf. 
Well, legally, you cannot just go in and rip up. You have to go through a very intricate process to deal with human remains mm -hmm. when you're doing development. So I was essentially hired to find out whether or not there was a slave cemetery, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, this is the old cemetery at Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church. Now, I knew that there had to be a slave cemetery there. The issue was, where was it? How did you know there had to be one? Because this church went back to the pre-Civil War days when slavery was still in existence. And slaves were not permitted to have their own churches. They oh. had to go to the slave owner's church. Many people wonder today why so many African-Americans have their own churches. Well, the reason is when freedom came in 1865, one of the very first things that African-Americans did was to establish their own churches. So, Because they were not but, allowed to before that. That's right, exactly. <clears throat> now, the, the, the top golf was going to go on this land back up this hill here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went to the church and I said, now y'all have got this nice old rock line cemetery. And you, you've got a lot of graves in there that go back to pre-Civil War days. Where is your slave cemetery? Well, their response was they weren't sure. Mm -hmm. Some of them thought it was back over here in this charge. You, you might see that there are not very many graves back here. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, it might be back here. So I said, well, I, can I go? and look at your archives. Well, they were very gracious at Mount Creek Presbyterian Church. And they let me go to the archives and I did, and they didn't have anything. So there was a man named Wayne, wait a minute, Vernon Heron, who years ago was really dedicated. He was a very intelligent, African-American gentleman and Vernon Heron had been very dedicated to trying to locate slave cemeteries. And he had an organization organization called Comprehensive Genealogical Services. And they surveyed slave cemeteries. Well, I went to the Charlotte Museum of History, went to their archives, and there's no doubt, there was no doubt that there was a slave cemetery. Now, because they went out and surveyed it. In fact, and I, I look, I mean, I'm telling you, Mary Dana, now this is where some of the church members thought the slaves might be buried, right? With, within the wall. They thought right. it was within the right. wall. Well, comprehensive genealogical services said, the slave cemetery is over here. Right, outside and the I'm wall. And I'm telling you, I went right up to this wall with members of the church, and, and I'm not criticizing any of the members of the church. And I said, could there be something over that wall there? No, no, we, we don't own that land. That's owned by somebody else. Well, of course, back in the 19th century, you know, it didn't, they didn't draw lines of property like they do today. So I went and looked back here and lo and behold, I mean, it took me about a minute to know that there was a slave cemetery there. And there's a plant called Vinca Minor. Now, a lot of people know Vinca Minor as periwinkle. Now, periwinkle was used as a very effective ground cover back in the 19th century. It covers the ground, keeps weeds out. It's attractive. It flowers in the spring. And one of the great ways to identify whether there's an old cemetery, it might not be a slave cemetery, 
But one of the best ways to identify it is find periwinkle. And there was periwinkle all over the ground. Now, your little blocky dookie thing kind of blocks out <laughs> this guy here. But what he's doing, it looks like a lawnmower. But it's not uh, a lawnmower. It's what, what's called ground penetrating radar. You can literally just go over the ground and you can penetrate the ground to see what's underneath it. And they found over 50 graves. Oh my I mean, goodness. 50 okay. graves right there. And um, Steve Crump told me, and this is, this is really sort of disappointing. Steve Crump told me yesterday that he went up there and put some flowers back in that area. That's, and he said they haven't done a thing with it. So it's not mark. There's no marker no, or no. anything. There's some flags in there, just flags in the ground. But they've really not done anything to to make it. And you know, it's uh, it's really frustrating because I tell you, Mary Dana, a lot of people. You know, I don't care what race we are or what ethnicity we are. We stand on the shoulders of early, earlier generations. And, you know, these human beings were um, so fundamental to the whole economy of Mecklenburg County in the first half of the 19th and the late 18th century. And, and they're just buried there. Right. And there's no, no real record. No. Of it. Right. Now, this is an interesting cemetery because you really run into two types of cemeteries. You find some that are churches, but there are some that are family cemeteries, particularly people who owned a good many slaves. Uh, you know, if somebody uh, had two or three slaves, that was one thing. But if they own 50 or 60 or 80, some over 100, um, they would have their own burial ground. It would not necessarily be at a church. Now, this is the Neely Cemetery, the Neely Family Cemetery. Well, you, this is down near Carowinds. Okay. And uh, you actually park in this parking lot over here. And I, gosh, gosh knows I was afraid I was going to get bitten by a snake. And I went in there and wham, what do I see? Periwinkle. Periwinkle. And I had been told because the company that had bought this property and was, this is a big industrial park type of place. They, 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 they did not want to disturb the cemetery. Right. And we did secure its designation as an historic landmark. And the Neely Slave Cemetery, and, and I might say that there's some interesting dimensions to this, this particular cemetery. Now, as far as the markers, you can hardly even see it. Little rock marker. Right. right. Yeah, I see. Now it's here is the see. slave owner. This is Mr. Neely here. And what you have over here, he has recorded in his Bible when his slaves were born. Now, here's that page, and you can say so and so born it gives the date. May, may, this is this stretches mainly in the 1850s, but not exclusively so. Now this is an important thing to recognize that, and I know this, I mean, I just, I just have to tell you the facts. Religiously, of course, these Christians, Neely, of course, was of the Christian faith. They believe that even though the slaves legally as I said last time, were personal property, they were still, of course, God's children. In other words, they, in the sight of God, they were equal, not in the, not, not in the law. 
and therefore, um, you know, they their births were to be recorded. And also, it was a very customary practice for really the slaves to more or less have control over the funeral process. The, the funeral process was slow for slaves was pretty much really handled by the slaves themselves. So, and, and you know, people talk about how slaves were treated. Well, it was so varied. There were obviously, um, first of all, slavery without any question was based on coercion. I mean, slaves had to do what they were told. And there were cases of uh, terrible abuse. But there were also instances of compassion and understanding. I mean, here's this man recording in his Bible the birth date of slaves. And I would equate the treatment. These people, they were, they, were, they were so enmeshed closely with one another. You know, they lived their lives. They, were, they didn't go anywhere. You couldn't travel far distances. It certainly wasn't easy. So they, they were with each other every day. And you think about domestic abuse today, Mary Diana, there some marriages where it's just terrible. You know, there's terrible are the, physical abuse. There yes. are others that that are more harmonious. And so you can't just, as far as the nature of the personal relationship, you can't just give one definition to what was going on. You said that the that the funerals were left to the slaves is that that's right, correct that's right that's well how right. how was that if they were not allowed to have their own churches well they of course had to be their people there either on the land or they had to, to, to they had to bury them at the, at the church but would a minister but, be at the funeral oh no 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 they 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 pretty much had control over the process of burial, you know. And a lot of the practices were were uh, carried over from Africa, like a ceremonial cleaning of the body, uh, long wakes, uh, a lot of emotional expression of mourning and agony. I mean, th these these were a lot of their burial customs came from their experience in African culture. But that's that's what I mean. Okay, now, this is really an interesting, what do you see on the ground, Mary Diana? Periwinkle. Periwinkle. Now, this is another of those family cemeteries. This one is up uh, on McCoy Road, obviously named for the family that on the slaves. It's up in Huntersville. And it's a very, very large cemetery. You would have at least 70, 80 graves in here. Now, these graves have never been identified. Nobody's ever gone in there with ground penetrating radar. But you could go in there with ground penetrating radar and you would immediately begin and Interestingly enough, the custom was to bury the head toward the east. And that was true of Christian burials, or white burials too. Now this is something, I don't know if you can really see this, but this is the monument that is in the cemetery. And they are basically, this is put up by, by the slave owning family. And they are giving thanks to favored slaves. Now, I have to keep the screen kind of dark because I've got an eye problem. I don't know if you can see the writing, but- Yeah, I can. What, what does it say? Can you read it? Erected by Albert McCoy's children to his slaves, Uncle Jim and his wife, Lizzie, Uncle Charles and family. 
Well, you know, auntie and uncle was a term of endearment. I have taken people to this marker up at the McCoy Slave Cemetery. I've taken African-American people there on a tour. And I've gotten very different and varied reactions. Some people respond uh, feeling that this is uh, insulting, very mm -hmm. patronizing. And, the, you know, they, they, they find it offensive. Other people regard it as uh, as really nice that the, that that people, in in, in essence, gave uh, some recognition to their former slaves. So it's uh, it's it's an interesting. But what it does demonstrate is the complexity of the nature of the relationship between slave and servant that existed. In you mean the, slave, slave and master? Slave you said and master. slave and servant. Yes, yeah, slave, slave and master. Right. You find that interesting? What's your reaction to that? Uh, you said, "Now you are not going to put me on the spot." Yes, I am. No, you the... no, you're not going to put me All on right. the spot. All right. Now you remember when we were talking about Eastover? Yes. And we talked about Providence Road. Yes. And we talked about how Providence Road got its name. I'll put you on the spot about that. <laughs> Do you remember how Providence Road got its name? Oh, because it went out to Providence Presbyterian Church. That's right. Now this church, this is an old church building. This church building was built in the 1850s. And it, it's an old building and it's still there. You know, and Providence Road used to go right in front of it. It's a long story about that, but uh, it's it and it still has its original slave gallery because slaves, when they came to church, they had a special section to sit in, and they had a separate entrance to go in. I'll show show you another example of that later. Now here is Providence Presbyterian Church has done a very sensitive job with their slave cemetery. You remember when I was looking at Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church, they just had a solid wall across there. Yes. Well, when you go to these these walled cemeteries, they're gonna bury the, 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 the master's family. They're gonna be burying one section. And by the way, just for the record, You've got a lot of ancestors buried in this cemetery. I know that. Uh, that the, here, here is where the the masters are buried. But you notice they've put a gate in. So what you do is look always outside the wall. Look outside the wall. If you walk through that gate, this is what you see. You see again uh, wooded area. They've cleaned out a lot of the periwinkle here. This looks rather different from mm -hmm. that Neely Cemetery or the McCoy Cemetery. But we're back again to a church cemetery. But you've noticed that they have put on the graves, they have put Crosses. markers that actually are the symbol of Christianity. Right, so they have marked each grave That's right. with, with a cross. Now, now another old Presbyterian church, it's Sardis. Now there's Sardis Road. In fact, you drive out Sardis Road. I do. To work every day, right? That's you true. You turn left on Sardis Road. Well, Sardis Road gets its name because it went to Sardis Presbyterian Church. Now Sardis was originally an ARP church, which is a very conservative um, branch of Presbyterianism. In the 1950s, it became a mainstream Presbyterian church. Very effective church. Now, they have both Native Americans and African Americans buried in this cemetery. Now, remember that there were instances when um, Native Americans served as 
slaves. And this is a, a small section of their cemetery. And you can see what they believe me is periwinkle. Yes, more periwinkle. And also, you notice what they have done is they have identified the location of the grave. They've gone in there with one of those things that looks like a lawnmower. The ground penetrating radar? Ground yes. penetrating okay. radar. And they have discovered the graves. And they've really done a nice job of maintaining it and to their credit. But this is another of those slave cemeteries. So, you know, most people drive out Sardis Road. This is across the road. As you go east on Sardis Road, the church is on the right. What's that um, school that, that Dan goes to? Oh, Providence Day for yeah, camp. right beyond they have camps. Providence Day. Yes. Right, right beyond Providence Day. The church is on the right. This cemetery is on the left. So that, but they, they have no idea it's there. So, you know, the institution of slavery, we talked before about the fact that, you know, over 8,000 people. Now, here's the Sardis church, and you can see there is a marker. Okay. Okay. Now, some churches, and I'm not going to, I'm not criticizing anybody. But this is Prosperity Presbyterian Church. Now, this is right off the outer belt. It's up at the edge of Charlotte, north, north up the northern edge of Charlotte. This is Prosperity Presbyterian Church Cemetery. And you can see I went in there with another person. Mm -hmm. There's our friend, Periwinkle. And yes. they haven't done anything. They haven't done anything. I mean, I know there. I know that that's slave cemetery because I know how to recognize them, and maybe some other people are recognizing them too. But you know, slavery is the evidences of slavery are all around us. Mm -hmm. Now, this is how am I doing on time? By the way, oh, twenty six minutes. That's what I have. Well, okay. Now, this is Hopewell Presbyterian Church. Now, Hopewell is an old, old church. I, you know, one of the things that's the most confounding about Hopewell, which is on Beatty's Ford Road, but it's out in the county. It's in Huntersville, really. And it, it's, it's this, this sanctuary dates from the 1830s, but it goes back, believe me, to the late 1700s. And your sixth great grandfather, great, 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 it was a Ron man Grace. named Alexander Craighead, was the minister at Hopewell Presbyterian Church. That's on my mother's side. He's not your relative, right? my mother's side that uh, i don't have anything but dirt farmers on my side of the family <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely now they don't know where their slave cemetery is and i don't know where their slave cemetery is. have you have you ever looked for it well yes but not not i hadn't gone out there i mean i'm so doggone old i don't walk in periwinkle much anymore but I mean, it's it's really confounding that they don't know, but they do have one very, now I'm gonna go around this corner right here. Here's mm -hmm. the main entrance to the church, right? But there's another entrance and it's over here on the side of the building. And that was the separate entrance for the slaves to enter. Is it so, marked? I mean, that's a, Yes, it is. There is a little plaque there. See that plaque? Yes. Now, they, they, they talk about the servants. Well, you know who the servants were. All right. But, I mean, that's a very graphic illustration. Now, this is the Alexander Slave Cemetery. It's like the Neely Cemetery 
It's like the McCoy family, Cemetery. Family cemetery. It's a family. It is really a big cemetery. And I have several slides here, but it's now in an, a, a gated apartment complex. Huh. The Historic Landmarks Commission was able to save it. It is relatively well protected, not as well maintained. It is covered with, you know what? Periwinkle. And this is an interesting <laughs> marker here to a woman named Violet Alexander, who was born into slavery, but this was erected by her children or her grandchildren. And I remember, this probably was in the mid 1970s. Here, the, here it is, Violet Alexander. This is the slave owner's house. This is the W.T. Alexander house designated historic landmark uh, located near UNCC, kind of down the hill from Mallard Creek Presbyterian Church. In fact, he went to Mallard Presbyterian Church and I actually walked through the woods, deep woods to get to this slave cemetery in the mid 1970s, but it's now in the middle of an apartment complex. Now here it is. Is Here's that a picture thing. from the seven from the nineteen seventies? That's that earlier. Took? That's earlier before it was fenced. I don't know exactly when I took this picture. I, probably that was, but you can see it's covered in periwinkle. Is that the marker? In, yes. In the middle, that's the yes marker. Yes, yes, that, and it's really the only sizable marker. And there are some other markers in here. Now, See now, wait a minute. I want to say about something about that sizable marker. Isn't it gone? Or is it still there? Still there. Okay, because there was some marker that got stolen from somewhere, I think. I'm not, I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar yeah, I, with it. I, I believe know. it's still there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, we put up a state marker. It's not a state marker. It's this is on Mountain Creek Church Work Road. We put up a, a, a mark by we, I mean the Historic Landmarks Commission, when I was the consulting director. And that does mark the W.T. Alexander Plantation Slave Cemetery. So that's that's what we did. That's now I smart. wanted to, how, how am I doing on time? Um, hold on, let me look at my timer. 31 minutes. Well, I can, I got time. Yeah, go ahead. I want to bring up an issue <laughs> that is really concerning to me. You know, there, there, and I'm talking about a very sensitive issue, and it's something that's going on even as we're speaking. You know, there are many people who are really emotionally uh concerned and deeply concerned a lot of protests going on there are a lot of um markers that are being taken down now you know i'm you know i'm involved with this group called preserve mecklenburg yes now this house was built by african americans they were enslaved african americans but it was built by african americans this is an absolutely magnificent piece of architecture. It was built between 1831 and 1833. It's a Greek revival style home. And I mean, it's magnificent. What's it? What's the name of the? I don't property? want to give the name. Oh, okay. That's part of the problem. I am so, we have preserved Mecklenburg has an option an assignable option to purchase this property. We just obtained it. And we're gonna to have to find a buyer. And it's in the National Register of Historic Places. It's been judged to be of statewide significance because it is such a significant building. And me, Dana, I'm afraid somebody might go out there and vandalize it. Because 
this man owned over a hundred slaves. Mm. Now his current family are remorseful about that. They are fine people. The last thing in the world they would ever want to do is own somebody. Um, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I just, I don't know. I hope people will separate a monument that's put up particularly by government, which is driven by contemporary politics. If they will separate that in their minds from an artifact like this, because these artifacts are priceless to teach us, to inform us. And also, I hope people will recognize that this is something that can be looked at as a wonderful example of just how talented so many of the enslaved people were to put up a house like this. So I guess what I'm doing here is just pleading for understanding, if you will. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is just a preserved Mecklenburg update. Now, today is the 21st of June when we're doing this. Mm -hmm. There's an article in the newspaper about the fact that, and a great article, that Preserved Mecklenburg has purchased the Patterson grocery store. By the way, I used to call it the Patterson Logan, but I think with further research, we ought to just call it the Patterson grocery store, and it will be preserved. And I think everybody, uh, we are so happy in Preserve Mecklenburg that we were able to work with a cooperative owner to save this building that otherwise would have been lost. Yeah, that's happy news. It is. And Mayor Dana, I have completed my journey. <laughs> well, thank you, Dad. And I appreciate all that information. And I think that if people want to be on the lookout for unmarked cemeteries that they look for periwinkle. Absolutely. And let me tell you what I'm going to talk about next week. Okay. We did Eastover. I really think we need to do Myers Park. Okay. So I, right. I'll, I'll do, I'll do, it might be two weeks, but I hope okay. to have it done by next week. We will do a podcast on the history of Myers park the neighborhood yes the neighborhood right. yes as opposed to you know the high school and we'll go back to some of those maps that i used in the east over one particularly the, the early ones okay all right well thank you and thanks everyone for joining us today and we will see you next time bye goodbye everybody